geriatrics is a fascinating field and has to be done in, uh, by a geriatrician in a very cautious way. The, the other, the, the field of geriatrics is also complicated because of the uh, difficulty in obtaining histories on, on, and speaking with people about how they're feeling. Uh, very often the, the history uh, is, is the pr primary way to diagnose somebody. So it's very important if you're telling your doctor what's bothering you, it's very important that you're very clear on the, the symptoms, uh, how, when it started, what symptoms you're having, how you're feeling. You have to be able to express yourself. And if you're not, for various reasons, if you're not able to either because of dementia or because the fever is causing delirium or you have memory lapses or you can't breathe well enough to speak, uh, then you should have somebody with you who can tell the doctor the history of the illness because it's very important for the doctor uh, to get a good history. The diagnosis is usually in the history and the physical examination just confirms it for the doctor as to what the problem is. So history taking is essential and can be very difficult in the older population. Another very difficult thing in the older population is falls. I'm sure we're all aware how difficult it can be if you fall and hurt yourself. Um, the, one of the primary things we do here in, uh, in a geriatric office is to make sure that the home is safe and the patients are being kept safe from falling. Falling is the, uh, the issue that I raise every time I see the patients to make sure that they're being as cautious as possible, not doing anything that's, uh, I say, just don't do anything stupid. Um, there's the issue of social isolation, uh, of course, made worse during this pandemic. Um, but there's also social isolation in other ways in the geriatric population. There's loss of relatives, loss of spouses, loss of friends. You have hearing loss and visual loss, so you tend to uh, uh, withdraw a little bit from society. So there's uh, social isolation, depression is a big issue in the geriatric population, and that affects the quality of life. So um, the, um, the other difficulty, of course, in the geriatric population is the risks of surgery. If there's surgical treatments that are required, this can be very difficult, and your, your underlying health has to be maximized. Um, the field of geriatrics is also uh, quite involved with subspecialties because a, a geriatrician can't handle all the problems all by himself. There's dermatology, there's dentistry that people have, neurology problems like we're going to speak about uh, dementia and Parkinsonism, cardiac problems, oncology is big because of the uh, cancer. So it's very important if you're going to have a geriatrician uh, to handle your health care, you're going to be you're going to have to see other specialists and the geriatrician acts more like a um, an organizer a, a manager of your health care rather than uh, having all the health care coming from the geriatrician you have to have a geriatrician you have to have a primary care physician to manage all the other doctors that are going to be required in your health care uh, nutrition is a big issue in uh, in the elderly po population uh, there is difficulty in chewing and swallowing sometimes there's difficulty in uh, motility in the gut. Um, there's uh, um, all kinds of difficulties with uh, constipation. So nutrition is a big field in uh, uh, geriatrics too. And then of course, there's the very sad issue of the end of life issues, uh, palliative care and hospice care. And, and because it's, this comes, it's inevitable, it comes to everybody. Um, it's very important early on uh, for an adult senior, a young adult senior, to make sure that they have done the legal paperwork on living wills. And in this state, it's called a mulched form, a, a, um, a um, uh, life-sustaining treatment form that ne needs to be filled out. That's a living will that states your wishes uh, at end of life, what you would like, how would you would like to be cared for at end of life. And you need to have a... Um, a um, a proxy, healthcare proxy, um, make sure that's done early on. You need to do all these uh, legal things. You have to think about your end of life care before you get there, uh, while you're still able to think clearly and know what you want at the end of life. And these issues have to come up in your doctor's office. Um, and there's of course the, the other issues of elder abuse, uh, which need to be, uh, uh, brought out to the surface, physical abuse, financial abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, all these things need to be brought out. 
the, the, the field of geriatrics is very complicated and um, an internist can handle it, no doubt, because the most uh, people who acquire healthcare are the oldest se seniors. Um, but uh, a geriatrician really has more experience in doing it. So the field of geriatrics is, uh, is essential in the, in the care of the elderly. Which, which brings me to uh, two of the very common, I, I listed a few of the illnesses we see a lot of in geriatrics, but two of the very common illnesses, uh, dementia and Parkinsonism. And that's uh, what I was asked to speak about today. The, um, the issue of Parkinsonism is um, a very difficult problem because it, it makes everything else much more complicated. It makes the, the, um, uh, the issue of falling more complicated because there's a higher risk of falling. Um, the, it makes a lot of the other uh, illnesses more difficult to manage. Uh, the, the medications in Parkinsonism are difficult to manage. If you do indeed have Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease, um, you definitely need to have, in addition to a internist or geriatrician who can manage the case, coordinate your case with, other, uh, with, your, with all your other comorbid conditions, but you really need to have a neurologist, and if you have a severe case, you really should have a neurologist with a, a specialist, a specialty in um, movement disorders. Um, the, the diagnosis of Parkinson's can, can be difficult at the beginning. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis. There are some tests we can do, but for the most part, this is a clinical diagnosis. This is a diagnosis that's made by the doctor by, by the history and physical examination. We can get some, there's, a, a, there's some spec scans, some nuclear scans that you can do. There's a, a DAT scan that you can do that would give you a hint as to whether somebody has Parkinsonism. But for the most part, the, the Parkinsonism is a clinical diagnosis. The symptoms of Parkinsonism, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, can start very subtly. And it usually starts with um, uh, slowness of movement, rigidity, what we call cogwheeling, which is... Uh, the loss of fluidity of, of motion, uh, a, a resting tremor, a stoop gait, loss of balance, tiny writing, depression, insomnia, sleeping a lot, dreams, hallucinations. But the early, the early uh, symptoms are uh, rigidity of movement and, and slowness of movement and loss of balance. Unfortunately, the pathophysiology of uh, Parkinson, Parkinsonism is, uh, is very complicated. Um, we leave that mostly to the scientists who study Parkinsonism, but in, in a nutshell, it's basically the loss of dopamine in, the, in various parts of the brain. The substantia nigra is the part of the brain that, that produces dopamine, and dopamine is then one of the major neurotransmitters. A neurotransmitter is a substance that allows nerves to, to communicate with each other. The nerves pass these chemicals back and forth to communicate with each other. So if there's a loss of a neurotransmitter, they, the nerve cells don't communicate with each other too well. And the, the primary defect of Parkinsonism is a loss of dopamine and the substantia nigra, and that gets transported to other parts of the brain, which then suffer the, from the loss of dopamine. So the treatment of dopamine, of the treatment of Parkinsonism is based on dopamine. Um, there are other non-chemical uh, treatments, things like you do here at the, uh, JCC, exercise, physical therapy, dance, boxing, uh, balance training, speech therapy, swallowing therapy, all kinds of things you can do to try to help Parkinsonism. But the basic medical treatment for Parkinsonism is based on dopamine. The, uh, the, the most common treatment for uh, early Parkinsonism is uh, levodopa. Levodopa is a chemical that is uh, ingested and then transported through the bloodstream into the brain and then converted to dopamine in the brain. It's usually combined with a medication called carbidopa, which prevents the breakdown of, levo, uh, of levodopa in the outside of the brain. Because if it breaks down too early and becomes dopamine outside the brain, it can cause a lot of nausea. The initial treatment of Parkinsonism involved a lot of nausea. Still, there's a, there's a lot of nausea in, in Parkinsonism, but if they combine carbidopa with the L-dopa, there's less nausea because the, the levodopa doesn't break down the dopamine until it gets into the brain. And that's basically the treatment for Parkinsonism, delivered as much dopamine as you can get in safely into the brain by the use of these uh, 
uh, chemicals, carbidopa and levodopa. The most common brand name is Cinemet. We are, we're all aware of that. The, there's Retari, which is uh, another uh, combination uh, medication. There's some inhaled dopamine uh, products and there's some uh, products that you can do it by tube feeding and people are unable to eat. But the most common ones are Cinemet uh, and uh, Retari. Then there's a whole series of classes of chemicals, uh, medications that we use that we, we call dopamine agonists. These are, these are chemicals that do the same thing. They deliver the effects of dopamine to the brain. Everything that, every, all the chemical treatments for um, uh, Parkinsonism is based on dopamine and dopamine-like activity. So there's other things that mimic dopamine. Um, they're they're uh, what we call dopamine agonists. Um, things like you've heard of Mirapex and Requip. They make one now called Nupro, it's a patch. These are added to the Cinemet or the uh, Carbidopa L-Dopa to increase the effectiveness of dopamine because it, it, they mimic the effects of dopamine. One of the early ones was called Parladel. We, we used to use that a lot. Now we use, mostly we use Mirapex, Requip and Nupro. The unfortunate thing is all these medications have side effects. I, I, I mentioned some of the nausea side effects of the levodopa, but there's also other side effects of these medications. Have not just the levodopa side effects, but all the dopamine-like chemicals that we use have other uh, side effects, like hallucinations and somnolence and sometimes compulsive behavior. Uh, so we also, we also have a lot of what's called, and you've probably heard of this on-off phenomenon where the Cinemet sometimes works and then sometimes doesn't work. And that's usually when we have to add another medication to try to smooth out that, that, that activity. So that's why a lot of Parkinson's patients are on more than one medicine. They take um, Cinemet, uh, which is carbidopa, L-dopa, and they add something like Mirapex, which is a dopamine-like substance. But there's other substances called MAO inhibitors you might be on also, which is things like uh, Azelect is a very common one, Eldapril. These tend to smooth out that on or phenomena. Some, you know, the Eldopa has a, has a quality of um, sometimes working well and sometimes not working well. Um, and so people have fluctuations in their Parkinson's symptoms. And these MAO inhibitors, these are another chemicals that smooth out because they, they reach a plateau and they smooth out that on or phenomenon. Um, the problem with those medicines, they, they're very difficult to combine with other uh, uh, medications like antidepressants, which we use a lot in, in Parkinson's and dementia also. Uh, there's other classes of uh, medications. There's anticholinergic medications like you probably heard of Artane or Cogentin. They tend to work mostly on the tremor. Um, there's uh, something called Compton, which I don't seem use too much anymore, uh, which kind of uh, slows down the breakdown of dopamine. So it allows the dopamine to hang around a little bit longer and be more effective. So it adds to the effect of dopamine. Again, all these medications have side effects and requires expertise to manage them. That's, this is why not only do you need a geriatrician to manage your case, but you really should have a neurologist because they have all the expertise of the, how, how all these medicines combine. We used to use a medicine that we now, we used to use a medicine called amantadine. We don't use it too much anymore. It's used mostly in early Parkinson's symptoms. And, and uh, sometimes we use it for the dyskinesia. I'm sure you're all aware that a lot of the side effects of these medications in late stage Parkinsonism cause movement disorders themselves. So in, 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 in addition to the, the slowness of movement and the bradykinesia and the, and the rigidity and the tremor that you have from Parkinsonism, the medications themselves can cause movement disorders called what we call dyskinesias. You may have uh, involuntary movements that you can't control that the medicines, long-term use of these medicines cause. Uh, sometimes you use other medicines to calm those dyskinesias down, but it can be very difficult. Uh, there are other non-medical treatments. I mentioned some of the physical activities that you could do uh, uh, as non-medical treatments for Parkinson's. They're very important to do that. There's some surgical treatments. I have not seen it used. You hear about this a lot in research about doing surgical treatment of very severe cases. Um, but I don't see that too much. Most of it is medical treatment and, and, and physical uh, therapy. There's uh, a lot of issues. A lot of patients raise these issues of uh, uh, delusions and hallucinations that 
that accompanies Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's a very difficult problem. Um, not only does Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism have hallucinations and delusions as a part of the illness, but the medications we use to treat the Parkinsonism can also have side effects of hallucinations and delusions and compulsive behavior. There are several medications we use to try to quiet these down. And again, you need expertise from people who, are, uh, who use these commonly. There's a new one that's been advertised pretty heavily. I'm sure you've heard of New Placid, which can uh, quiet hallucinations. There's sedatives like clozapine and uh, Seroquel, which is also called quetiapine. You've probably heard of those things like this that quiet the hallucinations down. So, so if you're having hallucinations from Parkinsonism, uh, or from the medications that you're taking for the Parkinsonism, you can use these medicines. But again, it requires the expertise of a neurologist or a neurologist with a, a specialty in movement disorders. And of course, the, the most uh, depressing part of uh, Parkinsonism is the late stage Parkinsonism, because unfortunately, Parkinsonism is progressive. These, there is no cure. There is, a, as I said, as you can hear, a lot of treatments available. A lot of successful treatments, but but Parkinson's disease is progressive, and we all have to face uh, end of life, uh, no matter what your illnesses are, or what your condition is. But but a, but the end of life and end stage Parkinson's disease can be quite difficult, and sometimes we have to resort to palliative care, which is comfort care, and hospice care, which is end of life care, and those issues are whole whole separate issues we can discuss some other time, uh, but. Um, uh, let's let's try to stick to the more to the less depressing parts of this disease, which is the management of the early to moderate Parkinsonism, uh, with uh, uh, exercise care, medication care, and uh, and nutrition. Um, exercise things like biking or just walking, stretching, Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates, dance, weight training, boxing, and nutritional things like increasing fiber in the diet to prevent the constipation of, of uh, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, low protein, no alcohol, low caffeine intake, small meals more often rather than large meals to prevent the nausea, elevation of the head of the bed if you're gonna eat in bed or just sit upright at the, in a chair uh, to eat because of the issues of swallowing difficulties in Parkinsonism, maintain hydration, um, and uh, you can add fruits and vegetables for fiber. Bananas are good because they have some magnesium, which helps some of the muscle twitches. Um, so th there's lots of things you can do for Parkinsonism. And uh, you really do need to have the special, uh, a specialist involved, a, a geriatrician, uh, because it's usually com comorbid conditions, heart problems and diabetes and stroke disease but you should have a neurologist at all times uh, and sometimes a specialist in movement disorders. There's another kind of Parkinsonism that's not Parkinson's disease, which is um, what we've been talking about, but this Parkinsonism that's caused by other illnesses, um, there's something called vascular Parkinsonism. Unfortunately, the symptoms are the same. They, you still get the Parkins, Parkinsonian type symptoms that we've discussed but the source, the cause is different. Uh, in vascular Parkinsonism, that occurs commonly in uh, smokers or other uh, illnesses that involve uh, poor circulation. Um, it's very important to treat the underlying conditions for the vascular illness, like high blood pressure and cholesterol, smoking cessation, diabetes, sedentary lifestyle, all these things can be treated to improve your vascular circulation. And that's a treatment for the vascular Parkinsonism. Vascular Parkinsonism is poor blood supply to the brain. So parts of the brain get damaged. And unfortunately, parts of the brain that control movement, like we had talked about the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia and other parts of the brain that control movement can be damaged by vascular, by circulation issues. They have the same symptoms, slowness of movement, stiffness of movements, balance difficulties, tremor, the, the problem with vascular Parkinson's, you can treat the underlying condition, as I said, cholesterol and smoking and diabetes and such, but unfortunately, the, these vascular Parkinson's uh, diseases are very difficult to treat with these dopamine type medications. Dopamine medications are used, they're just not quite as effective. 
Um, the way you diagnose vascular Parkinson's as opposed to Parkinson's, usually on a CAT scan or an MRI, you can see vascular insufficiency or a PET scan, you can see vascular insufficiency. Um, but the bottom line is very similar symptoms to Parkinson's disease, a little less responsive to, to, to therapy, but, the, but to, I should say, medication therapy, but also very responsive to physical therapy. Uh, so no matter what kind of Parkinsonism you have or Parkinson's disease, if you have that, very important to control your nutrition and do the physical activities that keep your life active and then have a specialist who knows how to manage comorbid conditions and, um, and the, the multiple uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease and the side effects of the multiple medications that are involved. Well, if there's anything you wanna ask me about Parkinsonism, I'm, well, well, uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions or any comments you might have. I have uh, a question, doctor. Um, yeah. What if, it, first of all, is it genetic? And is it possible to be tested very, very early on uh, so that perhaps you can stop the uh, dopamine uh, you know, take care of these things much earlier than, than one would until the symptoms appear, is what I mean to say? Well, there is no strict hereditary for Parkinson's. It's not like uh, Mendelian genetics where, you know, blue eyes or red hair or something. It does tend to run in families, but, but the, heredi the inheritance is really not very well worked out. In terms of recognizing it early, Unfortunately, there is no test you can do as a screening test for Parkinsonism, not that I know of. And uh, really, it's, as I said, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's a diagnosis that, that comes from looking at the symptoms. So if you, if you get good at it, you can recognize the symptoms early. Uh, so if, if you're having early symptoms, maybe your doctor can recognize it, or maybe they'll send you to a neurologist who'll be able to recognize it as Parkinson's. But in terms of early diagnosis, it's a clinical diagnosis. The, the diagnosis can be very tricky early on, and, but there is no screening test you can do to recognize uh, your propensity to Parkinsonism. And, um, and the hereditary, I don't want to get family members nervous because it's not really well worked out and it's not strictly inherited. It's the same thing, it's the same thing with Alzheimer's dementia. I mean, it tends to run in families, but there really is no strict inheritance. Um, I hope that what about that. searching for is there a gene for Parkinson's that that would show up if you had a genetic test like you would uh, Alzheimer's? No, well, not currently. Alzheimer's. There's certainly there's certainly a lot of research in the, into that field, and I'm not up on that research. But in terms of clinical usage, no, not that I know of. Anybody else have a question? I think the thing that really bothers a lot of Parkinson's patients is the hallucinations that the, that's brought out or the delusions that are brought out by the medications, uh, the somnolence, uh, uh, the, uh, the weakness in the somnolence during the day. Uh, th these, are, these are issues that are very difficult to manage um, and, and are quite bothersome. And again, that's one of the reasons why you need to have somebody with a lot of experience managing these conditions. Dr. Rand? What do, what do I know one of the things you mentioned is the yeah. tremendous fatigue. I've been hearing this a lot lately, the tremendous fatigue during the day, as you said. Is there yeah. anything one can do about that? These are people that are on multiple medications, of course, um, and they just find that they are just tired all the time. Um, well, occasionally do doctors will prescribe a, 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 a stimulant, but I don't see that all that often. Um, basically just managing the medications and keeping people as active as possible you know, with these, uh, with these physical activities. Um, because it, 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 when you have these movement disorders, you can become withdrawn and depressed. So you have to treat the depression and depression can lead to just boredom and sleepiness also. So uh, the, the, the management of the, of the fatigue and the somnolence is basically managing the medications and managing the, the conditions that come along with it. You can give stimulants in some cases, but most of the time it's just managing the comorbid conditions of depression and isolation and withdrawal. And that means keeping people as active. That's why your, your place is such a, is a good place for people to come because it keeps people 
socially active uh, and, and physically active. And that's really very helpful in terms of keeping people awake during the day and having normal sleep patterns at night. Very important to have that physical activity and the social contact. And just to reassure everybody, the social contact will be coming back. Uh, the vaccines are on their way and, and the pandemic will be over shortly. Uh, within the next few months, we'll all get everybody vaccinated and we can all come out of our houses and go back to the center and do things in person, have yoga classes in person and, and therapy classes in person. I encourage everybody to come back out when once we're all vaccinated and come back and, and do these activities because that's probably the most important part of the treatment of Parkinson's is the socialization and the physical activity. I mean, we could all play with the medications all we want and try to get you as, as, as comfortable as possible but it's very key to come out and be socially active get, uh, because the depression, uh, the depression that the isolation and withdrawal causes uh, makes the condition worse. And, and that's one of the reasons why people get so tired and weak and basically it's boredom. A lot of it's boredom. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of it's side effects of the medications. So you do need to manage the medicines, but we got to come out of our houses and get socially and active and physically active again. Dr. Rand, do you recommend th that these dementia patients and Parkinsonian patients get the vaccine? Would it harm them in any way? Well, listen, a lot, there's a lot up in the air about all these vaccines. We have to wait to hear from the FDA about the vaccines. The FDA is, is a, a, a group of the best scientists and doctors that we have, and they're reliable. They, they do the best they can to make sure that these fa vaccines are uh, efficacious and safe, and they won't release it until it is. It usually takes them years to go through these studies. They're doing this in a very rapid fashion, but they're still doing it as cautiously as they can. Um, and as far as I know, as far as I hear from the research that's being done and the studies that are being done, the vaccines are very effective and they're very safe. So there's no doubt that anybody well, first of all, everybody should be vaccinated, but certainly the seniors and the frail seniors especially should be vaccinated. Uh, people with Parkinsonism and other chronic illnesses, dementia, without a doubt need to be vaccinated because, because the, the, uh, we need to come out of our house. We need to be able to socialize and get back out and, and with people. Very important. That, that's, that's just as important as the, the treatment itself of the, of the illness is to come out of the house. And the only way we're gonna be able to come out is to take the vaccinations. As far as I know, the vaccines will be safe no matter what your chronic condition is, Parkinsonism uh, or, or dementia or other chronic illnesses, chronic heart disease, diabetes, kidney problems. The vaccines are safe, just like, just like the, the, the flu vaccine is uh, safe. Now it's true that some people have a reaction, but it's not common to, to have a reaction to flu vaccine. At, uh, and same thing with all the other vaccines. It, it, there are side effects from measles, mumps, and rubella uh, vaccinations and pertussis vaccines, but it's not. But it's not common. Vaccines are generally safe, and they are generally very effective. I mean, the new shingles vaccine is very effective, and uh, I haven't had a, a side effect from it yet. The flu vaccine this year is very safe. I haven't seen a problem with that yet. So I I hope. And I suspect that the vaccine, once it gets approved, will be very safe for all of us, including those frail people with chronic conditions. Yeah, and I would encourage everybody to take it. There's a lot of stuff in the news trying to uh, scare people about the vaccines because it came out too, so too quickly and there's a rush job. Believe me, these pharmaceutical companies are not gonna release a vaccine that's gonna destroy their business. If they make people sick with a vaccine that's premature, their business is done. And, it's, and it, it, we, we live in a capitalist society and um, these companies are not gonna to wanna to risk their company. So they're not gonna release it unless they know for sure that it's safe and effective. And the FDA are very reliable, bright scientists and doctors who won't release it unless they know it's safe. So I, I'm confident that all healthcare workers and all seniors should be the first to be vaccinated and we should vaccinate almost everybody. And the, the entire society will eventually get vaccinated and we can we can then come out from under this pandemic. Dr. Rand, can you give us your insight on the impact of uh, diet on Parkinson's? Uh, well, diet and Parkinson's, basically 
fruits and vegetables and high fiber foods are important because there's a lot of um, difficulties uh, with constipation early on. So those things kind of help constipation. For the muscle disorders, you want uh, uh, to balance your electrolytes. So electrolyte solutions are important. Things like um, bananas have a lot of magnesium, which is supposedly good for the, for the muscles. And I would encourage, I would encourage that. Uh, I would try to avoid alcohol because that only is depressing and also uh, increases your risk of falling. I would try to avoid caffeine because that could increase the risk of reflux and a lot of Parkinson's patients, I'm sure you know, have uh, swallowing difficulties and eating difficulties. Um, so I would try to avoid anything that might increase your, your acid reflux. Uh, I, would, I would eat small meals. Um, I would try to uh, cut down on proteins, uh, drink lots of water or other uh, liquids. And I would eat always sitting up so to avoid any aspiration. Late, late Parkinson's disease patients uh, very commonly aspirate because of the very severe difficulty swallowing. Um, that's basically it. I mean, there is no magic food for, for Parkinson's, unfortunately. Is the swallowing problem due to a neuromuscular complication? Well, it's a, it's a central issue. It's, a, it's, it's Parkinsonism. It's the same, the, the muscles of the swallowing mechanism are affected the same way your other muscles are, but it's central, it's a brain issue. And it's not, it's not, a, it's not an issue in the peripheral uh, part of the, of the uh, muscle, it's in the, it's in the brain itself. But, uh, but yes, we, it, it leads to other peripheral uh, problems with, with muscles because of disuse. You get a lot of atrophy of the muscles. And as and and, and and that's just kind of feeds on itself. You get you get atrophic muscles, including in the swallowing mechanism, and that atrophy makes you less active and less ability to swallow. And those muscle, muscles don't exercise as well, and they get just get weaker and weaker. That's why these physical activities are important, and that's why it is it is important to try to you know eat slowly, small meals, well chewed, moist foods, so that it, the, the dry foods don't get stuck in your throat. Always moisten the foods. Drink a lot of water to keep the foods moist and keep eating and try to be as normal as possible so that the muscles get exercised because you don't want muscle atrophy to set in. Is there any type of physical therapy or physical activity that you can do to, to strengthen those muscles? It's, it's Well, physical activity itself is good for the peripheral muscle, but in terms of swallowing, yeah, you do speech therapy. The speech therapists are experts in swallowing uh, uh, exercises. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um I see someone has their hand raised. Uh, Shirley, if you unmute yourself. Dr. Rand, is Alzheimer's uh, familial? Yeah. Well, that, families? you know, I get, I get that, I get that question a lot. It, it does tend to run in families, but I hate to make people nervous that way because unfortunately Alzheimer's disease is not preventable as far as we know right now. And it's not even all that easily uh, treated. There are treatments available, but it's not. So uh, yeah, I, I tend to make people very nervous if I say it, it, it runs in family. So I, I always try to reassure people that it's not strictly inherited. It's not, we don't have it worked out well. The scientists haven't figured it out yet. It does tend to run in families, but it's reason, it's, it's, it's pretty much random in, within the family. It, it, it's not, again, it's not Mendelian genetics like blue, blue eyes and red hair. There's no way you can predict it, but it does tend to run in families. There is a higher risk of Alzheimer's dementia if you have a first degree relative, brother, sister, mother, father, uh, who have uh, Alzheimer's disease. Is there any particular diet that's good for Alzheimer's? Well, let me, let me can, since you're talking about dementias now, let me give you a little, a very quick, um, uh, discussion uh, of dementias, if you don't mind, if that's okay with everybody. Um, because that, I mean, be that is, but that is very sure everybody is muted now. If... Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, dementia, dementia and Parkinson's, uh, unfortunately can sometimes run together, but it is, it is a separate issue. There is, there is, um, dementia with Parkinsonism, which is, which is not a, uh, an easy problem. But let's talk about just dementias themselves. Very common. Um, there are about 60,000 new Parkinson's cases a year in this country, but there's, there's about 3 million cases of dementia per year. 
Um, now, dementia is a, is a group, is a very nonspecific term. It's a group of disorders. Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. So dementia is an all encompassing term and Alzheimer's dementia is a type of dementia. It happens to be the most common form. It probably makes up anywhere from 60 to 80% of all dementias is Alzheimer's dementia. Very common, unfortunately, it's over the age of 80, there's one in six people have uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And even over the, just over the age of 60, 65, one in 15 people have uh, the onset of uh, Alzheimer's dementia. So it's, unfortunately, it's a very common illness and therefore very important for us to get a handle on it. Uh, right now, they're you know, working feverishly to figure out the cause. We just don't know the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And, I, and as I said, it does tend to run in families, <clears throat> but it's not strictly genetic. And uh, they're working on the heredity factors now. Now, almost all dementias start off with simple memory loss. So lots of, I get this question all the time. A lot of people come to me worried that they're becoming demented because they don't remember things. They can't remember short-term things like where they put their keys or where they place down their, their, uh, their coat, uh, just short-term memory loss. And I have to reassure people all the time that sh this kind of cognitive loss, memory loss of short-term recall does not necessarily go on to dementia. As a matter of fact, most of the time it doesn't. There are different degrees of cognitive loss of aging. Some people have very, uh, uh, some people don't have it at all, but some people have very mild forms of memory loss and some people have more severe forms. But memory loss in itself is not dementia. We call it cognitive loss of, uh, I mean, uh, cognitive loss, loss of aging or mild cognitive loss. That not, doesn't necessarily go into dementia. So because if, you, if, you, if you're getting older and you find that you don't remember things as well, which I think most people find, uh, you don't have to get all nervous about, uh, about the, uh, going on to dementia. If you start to progress to other things like not only memory loss, short-term recall loss, but you start to lose the ability to learn. You can't, re you can't remember things, so you can't learn things. And then you start to lose your ability to make proper judgments or to focus yourself or to control your emotions or uh, reasoning difficulties, de loss of social skills. Those are the things, the dif difficulty in solving problems you know, daily live life problems, dif more difficulty with that and getting emotional about it. Those kinds of things indicate that perhaps you're going on to more significant types of dementias. Again, the dementia, just like Parkinson's is mostly a clinical diagnosis. Um, there really is not a good laboratory test available that we could say, yes, you know, you have, you know, things like diabetes. We could say, yes, you have diabetes because this test shows you have it. We don't really have that either for, uh, Parkinsonism or for uh, dementias. Um, so it's a clinical diagnosis that takes a little bit of skill also. That's why uh, somebody with experience, a geriatrician or a neurologist uh, should be making the diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. There are ways, you, there are testing you can do there. We've all seen the mini mental status exam. I do it at my office, my office on every patient. There's the uh, mini cog test. There's a clock drawing test. You can do other, other tests but most of the other tests that we do rule out other other things. Like if if uh, if you're finding that you're you're not not speaking clearly or you can't uh, express yourself clearly, you you really need to have a CAT scan or an MRI of the brain to make sure you're not suffering from something other than the onset of dementia. Things like infections or strokes, tiny little strokes, or uh, hydrocephalus, which is a a volume uh, pr uh, problem in the brain all of which can be treated in other fashions and important to rule out. So there are tests you can do to rule out other illnesses that affect the cognition, but mostly those are rule out tests. It's tests that rule out other things. And then when, once you rule out other illnesses, thyroid illnesses or vitamin deficiencies or electrolyte abnormalities or diabetes out of control, strokes, hydrocephalus, tumors, you have to rule all those out with these tests then you can go on to some of these cognitive tests like the mini cog test and the clock drawing test or the mini mental status examination. But for the most part, the diagnosis of early dementias is a clinical diagnosis made by an experienced doctor, uh, an internist or a geriatrician or a neurologist. 
Very often you need to have a psychiatrist involved because very often depression can make, make somebody appear. I'm muted. Somebody, um, if, if you get depressed, very often you get something called pseudo dementia. So it, you appear that you're coming with the onset of dementia, but it's mostly depression. It's a mood disorder. And that has to be evaluated by your, your physician or a psychiatrist, because the, if you treat the depression, fortunately, the cognitive decline improves also. But if you come to the conclusion that somebody's having some form of dementia, then you have to figure out what form it is. It's almost, it's very commonly Alzheimer's disease, which is we, do, we just do not know the cause and, and there is no good treatment. And then the next most common is a vascular dementia, which I mentioned, which damages the brain and it can lead to some Parkinsonian symptoms too, but it damages the brain because of poor circulation. So you have to treat the poor circulation, treat the high blood pressure and treat the diabetes, treat the smoking, um, treat the cholesterol. You treat everything else to improve the circulation and that can halt, not halt, but slow down the progression of the dementia. But for the most part, we're, talking, we're dealing with Alzheimer's dementia. And, and the early stages, you go from having a normal brain to being forgetful. And mo as I said, most people become forgetful and lose short-term recall, have cognitive loss of aging, and they don't necessarily go on to dementia. But if you're, the, if you're unlucky enough to, go to, pro to progress, you go into the later stages with problem solving and work performance and difficulty concentrating and difficulty judging things and problem solving. Very often people start to get lost if they're driving and that's when you have to stop driving because it can become dangerous for you and others. Then you go on to even the later stages where you get withdrawn and poor responsiveness and poor task performances. And you have be begin to uh, fail in your uh, ability to function in terms of activities of daily life. Your hygiene declines, your toileting, uh, you forget how to toilet. Um, you, you begin to forget uh, cherished memories, and then you go to the late stage where you don't even recognize your own loved ones. So it can be very depressing and very isolating. And you need to, you need, you need not only do you need a, a doctor who can recognize it and treat it, but you need to have caretakers who really understand the disease and understand because very often it can be very depressing and very frustrating, and a lot of Alzheimer's. And dementia patients get very uh, frustrated and angry and and anxious and uh, hostile and the caregiver is the key to, to their treatment because the caregiver has to be very understanding because it's it's not it's not the the patient's fault so it takes a it can, takes a real strain on the caretakers i always say that the caretaker is as much a victim of the illness as anybody else and the caretaker needs to be very cautious to, to take care of his or her health and get assistance at any, you know, with AIDS to get assistance because you need a break and uh, you take a vacation, do something you enjoy doing because it, you, it can be very, very uh, frustrating. You have to use patience and understanding. You have to remain flexible. You have to be very good at assisting with activities of daily life. You got to get over your fears and help somebody toilet and, and shower. Um, brush their I teeth. Just missed it. It's very difficult to be the caretaker, but that is the key uh, to the treatment of dementias. The, the medications we use for dementias are not as important as the caretakers. The caretaker, assisting in memory tasks, reminders, medication management, uh, involving the patient in, in activities that they enjoy, allowing the patient to express their emotions, to express their frustrations, get patients in a routine so that their daily routine is recognizable and that helps reduce some of the confusion and disorientation. Try to keep the environment for the patient the same. Uh, that's why if you, if you hospitalize somebody who has early to moderate dementia, it gets worse, at least temporarily in the hospital because of the change of environment and the time schedule. Getting into a routine, if you, ha if you have a routine, it really helps the patients. The caretaking of a dementia patient is much more important than the medications. The medications we have, I'm sure you're all aware of these things, Aricept and Exelon, Razodyne, Namenda. Those are the four memory medications that we use. And there's other things we use um, off-label, things that are more sedatives for people who, who get what's called agitated dementias. There really is no good sedative available that's approved by the FDA 
for the treatment of agitated dementias. But we use these antipsychotic sedatives because we really have no choice. They do work. They, they carry some risks, and it requires experience to manage them. But but we we do have to use some of these medicines off label to manage the agitation and the frustration and the hostility that can come in later stages of the dementia. But more important than medications, these these medications slow you know, things like Exelon and Razadine and Namenda and uh, Aricept, they can slow the progression of the disease, which is relentless. But they slow the progression only to a small degree. And the antipsychotic sedatives can quiet the patient and make them more comfortable and less anxious, less depressed, um, and less uh, frustrated and angry. These are all helpful things. But the most important thing is the caretaker. So the caretaker has to take care of the patient, but also take care of him or herself. Because it's very important to stay calm get the patient into a routine, be patient and flexible and loving. The most important thing for a dementia patient is to have a loving family around. The unfortunate people who have nobody around uh, can, be, it can be very, very difficult and, and not fair. Um, uh, there are very severe forms of dementia, which um, I would say uh, Lewy body dementia is a very difficult dementia because it involves is a combination of the dementia and the Parkinson's, Parkinsonism that we discussed earlier. Lewy body are these little uh, proteinaceous deposits that occur in the brain. We don't really know how they relate to the cause of the disease, but the, the outcome is, is pretty dismal. It's, it's dementia and Parkinsonism together. So you have the cognitive decline and you have the movement disorder, which also is, deteriorates uh, over time. Um, again, the, the, uh, the more, more important than the medication for these illnesses and this type of dementia, the most important thing is the caretaking. There's a lot of hallucinations and nightmares and insomnia and restlessness and agitation and wandering. And the most important thing is for the caretaker to be trained in, um, not trained, but have experience and gain some experience in being calm uh, uh, and, and patient and flexible and loving. Um, and uh, uh, it can be very difficult. I always feel for the caretaker. Uh, very often the demented uh, patient uh, doesn't, you know, there's all kinds of range of, of the dementia from patients that are very calm and accepting of their fate, to patients who are very anxious and frustrated by their, by their disease. Um, but if you can uh, keep, if you, you're lucky enough to, you know, I mean, I can't really call it luck. It's not, none of these dementias I would consider lucky, but if you're lucky enough to have uh, a calm, quiet, uh, accepting patient, uh, that is uh, a much easier caretaker's role. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you have an agitated, angry, and frustrated uh, dementia patient, you have to be uh, very understanding that it's not their fault. It, it's hard, even hard to imagine what it must be like to have these late stages of dementia uh, and, and, and not be able to to be uh, who you used to be. Um, uh, you, uh, the, the caretaker is the most important thing. Um, there, were, there were other kinds of uh, dementias uh, which, which we can discuss some other time. Yeah. Um, the prognosis for Alzheimer's uh, dementia is it's a relentless decline. The medications can slow the decline. Um, uh, some patients can last decades with, with Alzheimer's dementia. It could be up to 20 years, uh, but unfortunately, Alzheimer's dementia can progress uh, quite quickly, and the average progression is anywhere from four to eight years from diagnosis. Um, very, very depressing, and uh, sometimes a psychiatrist should be uh, involved. One thing I have to warn you about with, uh, with the treatment of dementias is the, the all the over-the-counter remedies that are uh, out there. Um, I don't know of one of them that's been proven to do any real good. And we all hear, I get these questions all the time about things like um, Prevagen or Ginkgo biloba or um, uh, uh, Hyperzine A, uh, uh, fatty acids, vitamin E, ginseng. Um, n none of these, as far as I know, none of these remedies actually work. They make a lot of claims because they're able to, because they're not FDA regulated, so they can make any claims they want. 
But uh, just so you know, Prevagen, which is one of the more popular ones, and it's only popular because it's so heavily advertised, not because it works. Uh, there is no proof of efficacy. And actually, they've been, they've been um, fined by the FTC, not the FDA, but the Federal Trade Commission for false advertising because they claim all these claims and none of it's true. So don't be fooled by all this. And the ginkgo, same thing with ginkgo biloba, hyperzine A, uh, vitamin E. They, they're, none of it's proven. Uh, even the prescription medicines we have are not all that effective. And certainly the, the non-prescription agents are, uh, are totally unproven. As far as, as far as I know, the best thing you can do in terms of taking things into your body is to have a good diet. Um, uh, uh, if you want to take omega-3 fatty acids, because there's some people who claim that that helps the memory. Uh, I don't, that's not been proven, but a lot of people want to take uh, fatty acids, omega-3s. But the more important than taking uh, omega-3 fatty acids is to actually eat cold water fish. First of all, they're delicious. And, uh, you know, salmon, tuna, um, uh, trout, mackerel, sardines. These are all uh, cold water fish. They have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids and they're very healthy to eat. Plus they supply some protein too. You can get omega-3 fatty acids from nuts. Nuts are very healthy, all kinds of nuts. So pecans, almonds, walnuts, they're all very healthy. And fruits and vegetables, uh, again, very healthy. So in terms of taking uh, over-the-counter agents, I would discourage it. Um, and I would say, keep, stay on a good diet like I just discussed and, and have a good geriatrician, internist, neurologist uh, to try to manage the numerous medications. If, certainly if you have Parkinsonism and dementia simultaneously, you're gonna be on a lot of medications. So they have to be managed properly. There's a lot of drug-drug interactions um, so have a good doctor that knows how to manage it and, min and minimize the medications, which is why I tried to discourage the over-the-counter remedies, because not only are they not effective, but they do complicate things. They, you, you, nobody knows the interactions of these medicines and their effects on the, on the prescription medicine, so it complicates the care. So I'd be very cautious about these over-the-counter remedies. Okay, so that's my spiel on that. So now, if you have any questions or Doctor, comments? what about turmeric? Say that again? What about turmeric? Uh, turmeric? Uh, turmeric, actually, um, I, I don't know of any benefit, uh, uh, any proven benefit in terms of dementia or Parkinsonism, but there are some people that swear that turmeric helps their arthritic conditions. So it's used very, a lot in people with osteoarthritis. And that might be a complication of movement disorders too. There, you know, because uh, as people get older, they we all have degenerative joint disease, and some people have worse than others. They get osteoarthritis. So, if that helps you, I, I you know, listen. I don't have any problem with it with um, a an over the counter herbal remedy, if it helps you, even if it's a placebo effect. Mm -hmm. But if it helps you and it doesn't hurt you, there's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> so, glucosamine chondroitin people use for their joints. Uh, turmeric, cur curcumin, they, they use these agents mostly for arthritic joints. Uh, mm -hmm. You have this CBD oil that uh, is really, again, it's unproven uh, uh, in terms of its uh, many uses that are proposed. Most of it's unproven. There is some evidence that it might help people with sleep disorders. So if you have a sleep disorder in Parkinson's, maybe CBD oil might help. Um, it has some, some uh, evidence that it, there is some pain relief qualities to uh, CBD oil, um, uh, but the evidence is not great. But all the other claims that these companies make about CBD oil, which is the, which is the, the ingredient of marijuana, that's not hallucinogenic. It's the other ingredient that doesn't cause the hallucinations. Uh, I certainly would not use marijuana, and certainly I wouldn't use it in Parkinsonism or dementia because you can make the hallucinations worse and it can be very frightening. But if you want to use CBD oil for arthritic pains or sleep disorder, there is some evidence, but not great evidence. Jerry, I, would, I, would, I would use turmeric or turmeric or curcumin for my arthritic patients if they ask me about it. I don't have, there's, there's very little downside to trying them. They have such a low incidence, though, in India of Alzheimer's, and it's because they have uh, turmeric in their diet. I don't know that that's the reason. I, I think that's a, I think that's a um, that's a guess, but I, I don't know if that, that if that is actually the reason. The etiology or the the cause of dementias 
are uh, is really unknown. So that's a guess. It's not. It may be true, but I'm not sure that that it's ever been shown. Jerry has a question. Go ahead, Jerry. Unmute yourself, Jerry. Dr. Rand, I have a family physician and a geriatrician. Is that contraindicated? Well, I would, listen, as you get older, you're going to have a lot of doctors. You're going to have a cardiologist and, a, and an endocrinologist and a rheumatologist and a dermatologist and every allergist you can name. You're going to have a lot of doctors because the, the primary care physician needs help. The primary care physician um, will require the assistance of the, of the experts to manage your case. He's the case manager. He puts it all together. Uh, so I always tell my patients, it's, since you're going to have a lot of subspecialty doctors, it's very important to have only one primary care doctor. Too many cooks spoil the stew. Uh, the, the primary care physician, which is either the geriatrician or the internist or the family practitioner, you should only have one of them because they, they're going to be the case managers. They're going to manage all your medications, yes, speak with all your other doctors, get notes and consultation reports from your other doctors, get all your tests together and put it in one place and put it all together. That's what your primary care physician should be doing. If you have more than one primary care physician, it's a, it's a little risky because you might get different, advice, different types of advice from, from each of them. Because there's no, there's no right or wrong answer very often. It's, it's a skill. It's, a, it's, a, it's an art. Um, and, and you may be getting different forms of advice. And it could be very confusing. And it might, it might sometimes be dangerous to have more than one uh, primary care physician. So I always encourage you can have as many specialists as you need to take care of your many uh, conditions. But you should have only one uh, primary care. And that includes geriatricians, internists, and family practitioners. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody? Here's your chance. Yep. Anybody? Am I, miss am I missing a hand or a, I'll just check the chat now. Okay, any, one more minute of potential questions? Yes. I have a question about um, a hot, the hospital. Dr. Rand, that you're affiliated with? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I used to go to South Nassau Communities Hospital. And I now go to Mercy Medical Center in Markville Center. Okay. And what if um, we're affiliated with a hospital in New York, New York Hospital? Would it not be a good idea uh, to, use, to use you or a doctor out here? Is it better to use somebody who's affiliated like you are and go to Mercy as opposed to going into the city? Uh, first of all, I always, I always recommend seniors to choose medical care, including their hospital and their physicians in a local geographic area. Because otherwise you're gonna have, if you go into the city for your routine medical care and you get sick somewhere out here on Long Island, you're gonna end up on a, in a hospital that nobody knows you because that's where they'll take you. They're not gonna take you to the city. You're gonna to go to a hospital where nobody knows you. So I don't like uh, patients seeing, I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, you know, patients can, are free to do what they want, but I recommend that you have all your healthcare in a local area, local to where you're living. Um, and, if you, and if you move, unfortunately, if you move far away, you need to get a new set of doctors. Even if you're just moving from Nassau County to Suffolk County, you, you need to get a new set of doctors so you can have local doctors because it, you, the, the geography interferes with your health care. Sometimes it's difficult to, to, to make the trip as you get older. And of course, if you do require hospitalization, which we try to avoid, but if you do require hospitalization, you'll end up in a hospital where none of your doctors are at. So going into the city for your health care may be a mistake. There are lots of good doctors on Long Island. And now most of the major institutes are coming, most of the major institutions are coming out to Long Island. So you could see that um, NYU came out to Winthrop and uh, Mansone came out to South Nassau. And you've got a very good heart institute uh, here at St. Francis. Um, uh, you, there's no need to go into the city. Uh, and I, I, I certainly have patients who do that, and I, I take care of them anyway, but I do encourage people to have local health care. 
Does that answer your question? I think it did. Okay. Yep, I think it did. Okay. All right. Pam, you wanna? You wanna... Yeah. So I, I thank you so much, Dr. Rand. This was uh, wonderful. And uh, I, I could see there's plenty more uh, that you could bring to us. Uh, so we hope you'll come back for a return visit. I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to. Okay. Hopefully after the pandemic is over, wouldn't that be nice? It would be nice to do things in person once yes, again. It, it, yes, would, it would, it would, it would be good for all of us. It would be great for all of us. Yeah. It's time, but it's coming. It is coming. Just encourage everybody. I don't know when you plan on opening up again to in-person visits, but it's soon. And you should encourage people to come back um, and just make sure that they remain optimistic that it is, that is it, this is not a forever thing. A pandemics never last forever. Even without a vaccine, it wouldn't last forever because viruses do tend to get weaker as time goes on. And that, and that makes sense because if, a, if a, the viruses mutate all the time, if, if a virus becomes stronger from a mutation, it usually kills the, the host that it gets into. And the, the, the virus dies with the host, they get buried with the host. If the virus mutates into a weaker form, it doesn't kill the host and then the, the virus gets passed on to the next person. So over time, viruses naturally get weaker, which is why SARS-1 just disappeared. It just went away. Mm. We never made a vaccine, it just went away. And that could happen to SARS-2. That, that's what COVID-19 is, SARS-2, it's a coronavirus. And they will get weaker over time. So it's never gonna last forever. Certainly this, this vaccine or this series of vaccines we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna have the opportunity to use, that's gonna solve the problem. And I would be very optimistic with patients because it's, it's even more depressing to think that this is gonna go on for, for much longer. So if you're optimistic and you encourage people that you're gonna open soon and you're gonna bring back the in-person classes and in-person uh, lectures and in-person physical uh, exercises, it can be, uh, it can, it can hold people off from becoming withdrawn and isolated. And family is important. So you got to make sure the family's involved with these old folks. Um, and if they don't have family, make sure they have people visiting them, even if it's from a distance. But, but you got to keep people um, op optimistic that they're going to come out of their houses soon. You know, yeah. the, old, the younger people are coming out now, but the older people are still afraid. And I understand that. And, you know, you don't want to catch something bad. Um, but, but optimism will help. There was one last question. Someone asked, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, uh, what the side effects of the vaccine might be. We, we don't know yet, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that they'll be the same as any other vaccine, which is uh, soreness in the muscle and perhaps a low-grade fever for a day or two. And that's it. Now, could you have a more severe reaction? It's possible. I mean, I've been giving flu vaccines out for th close to 40 years. And I've had one serious reaction, one, out of all those years, I've had one. Now, people can get low grade fevers and they get a little achy and they can get a sore shoulder. Most of the older folks don't get that kind of reaction. As you get older, you get less reactive. Your immune system is less reactive. So you have less of a reaction to the, to the shots. So it's really unusual to have a serious reaction. Could it happen? Yes. And it, we'll have to wait to hear from the FDA to see how, how safe and what the potential side effects are. Nobody really knows yet what's going on, but except, except the, the study, the studies they're doing show that it's reasonably safe. It's probably gonna be like taking a flu vaccine. It has some potential early low grade side effects, but, but in terms of a serious illness, I, I, I doubt it. it. It could happen. I mean, we had the swine flu vaccination campaign had a higher rate of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a serious reaction, and they took that off the market. But that's pretty rare compared to all the vaccinations that we've been giving out over the years. I mean, these vaccinations have cured diseases. Polio and smallpox are things of the past. Uh, measles, up until recently, was the thing of the past. These are very dangerous illnesses that, that have been cured or, or are markedly controlled and and flus the flu vaccine is a terrific thing and and this vaccine is going to come out good too um i don't expect that to be a, a a tremendous uh side effect that we have to worry about they won't release it all right jerry i think you had something you wanted to ask do they know how long it will last no no uh 
you know, some vaccinations last, last a lifetime. You know, measles, mumps, rubella, they last, last a lifetime. Flu shot lasts six months. Uh, tetanus shot lasts 10 years. You know, it varies from, from the illness. It, it, and we don't know yet. I mean, this, this coronavirus is brand new. So we don't know how long the immunity to it will last. I could tell you, it appears to be, from the few patients I've had who have gotten sick and developed antibodies and are still maintaining their antibodies, it's at least three or four months, but it could be longer. And it, we just don't know yet. It hasn't been around long enough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you okay. So All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rand. Much appreciated. Okay. Anytime. And, a pleasure. And, and thank you all for coming on. And we will have, we have our next presentation that we are running actually is Monday night at seven o'clock. We are doing a president, we're having a panel presentation on senior care options and how to pay for them. That's even better, right? Yeah. Um, so it, we're having someone from uh, the Bristol, we're having a, an elder care attorney, Wendy Goidel, and we are okay. having a, the director of Caring People Home Care Agency. Um, and so I think it should be really interesting. It's at seven o'clock Monday night. I think I've sent out a lot of um, yeah. Zoom instructions, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Pam and we will send out the Zoom instructions once again. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank, Thank, you, you, Dr. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Rand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rand. Thanks, Dr. Everybody, have fun. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.